Namaskar and welcome to this lecture on concrete engineering and technology. In this series we have been talking about fundamentals, proportioning, stages in concrete construction, special concretes, mechanisms of deterioration, reinforcement and maintenance. Now continuing with our discussion on the fundamentals which is the first part of the discussion we have been talking about constituents of concrete and we know that concrete comprises of coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, ordinary Portland cement and water. We are not talking of mineral and chemical admixtures which have become an inherent and an integral part of the concrete construction, but we will talk about that later. As far as the first round is concerned, we will talk of absolutely normal concrete comprising of these four elements. Now, coming to the discussion on cement which is of which is ordinary Portland cement. We must remember that cement is the only reactive component in concrete and the hydration products which are formed when cement reacts with water that provides the binder for the aggregates. Therefore, the properties of concrete are determined to a large extent from the properties of cement and the binding hydration products. Also, cement is the most expensive of the components and efforts need to be made to minimize the cement content in the concrete mix. Codes often prescribe a minimum and a maximum content of cement in a concrete mix. The minimum is prescribed from the point of view of durability and so on, whereas the maximum is sometimes prescribed from considerations of heat of hydration and so on as we shall see sometime later. Now coming to ordinate Portland cement, we have already talked about some of these things manufacture, constituents, physical and chemical properties and hydration. Today we largely concentrate on the properties of OPC and the hydration reactions that are important in our understanding of the properties of the cement paste as well as the properties of concrete. Now as far as these three things is concerned, we have already talked about that and we know that manufacture of OPC essentially involves grinding of constituent materials, mixing them, heating the mixture in a kiln to a temperature of about 1450 to 1500 degrees centigrade, cooling this fused mass to produce what is called clinker and then grinding the clinker to a very fine powder in ball mills and that is how we get ordinary Portland cement. During the grinding, gypsum or plaster of Paris to the extent of about 3 percent is added to control and regulate the hydration of the cement and that is the role of gypsum. In the absence of gypsum, the tricalcium aluminate C3A which is one of the principal constituents of the cement reacts too rapidly with water and the hydration products formed render the cement unworkable and thus to regulate the setting process gypsum is added to the clinker at the time of grinding. We should remember that in order to have reasonable construction using concrete, the cement should be such that it allows the concrete to remain workable for at least some time so that the concrete can be transported, placed, vibrated and transportation sometimes takes a lot of time. It could be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe one hour if we are using ready mix concrete. Even if we are using the concrete at site, even then it might take about 15 minutes or 10 minutes to transport the concrete from the actual mixing site to the place where it has to be placed or the structure which is being cast. Therefore, the concrete must remain workable during that time. Having said that, after that it should harden and the concrete cannot be allowed to remain workable for a too long a period of time and therefore there has to be a lower bound on the initial setting time of cement and an upper bound on the final setting time of cement and that is the window in which we play. And once we have the cement which conforms to these regulations, we are ready to use it in concrete construction. 
Now, coming to the clinker, we have seen this photograph before. Portland cement, as we said, is manufactured by heating a mixture of limestone and clay in a kiln of 14 in a kiln to a temperature of 1400 to 1600 degrees centigrade, where the raw ingredients chemically interact to form new phases during clinkering and the product being called clinker. And this clinker emerges as marbles or golf sized lumps as shown here. And that must be finely ground to produce the OPC. So, this we can see here is a particle of clinker. And if we see it along the scale, which is given at the bottom, we can see that this particle or this piece is about two and a half centimeters in diameter or having a dimension of about two to one half centimeters. Now, if you look at the chemical composition of the clinker, it contains C 3 S that is the tricalcium silicates also called alites, which are about 20 micrometers to 50 micrometers and B light, which is dicalcium silicate C 2 S, C 3 A and C 4 A F, which are the aluminate and the ferrite phases in the clinker and they are there in the interstitial phase whereas, the C 3 S and C 2 S which constitutes about 70 to 90 percent of the clinker. We must also remember that C 3 S if you look at it in a microscope with sufficient magnification you will find that it is angular in shape whereas, C 2 S is rounded. Recall that in cement chemistry C is calcium oxide, A is aluminum oxide, F is Fe 2 O 3 and S is SiO 2. So, when we say C 2 S or C 3 S, we are talking of complexes which are formed due to the fusion of calcium oxide and silicon oxide and so on. Now, continuing with our discussion on the constituents, we have seen that since the raw material is essentially oxides that is of calcium, silicon, aluminum and iron, the product that is OPC is also made up of these oxides. Typically, the oxide composition or the composition of OPC in terms of the oxides is shown here. These we should remember are very stable compounds and therefore, do not break when they are subjected to heat and grinding and so on. Whereas, the products like calcium carbonate they get decomposed to give you SI to give calcium oxide and carbon dioxide and so on. Now, if you look closely at these this composition there is a, a alkali content of the cement which is basically arising out of the presence of sodium oxide and potassium oxide which are impurities that contribute to the alkali content. It is common to express the alkalinity of the cement as equivalent Na 2 O given by the Na 2 O content and 0.658 times the K 2 O content. I am leaving as an assignment for you to determine what is the basis of this factor of 0.658. Please try to do some simple arithmetic and I am sure you will get the answer. And based on this equivalent Na 2 O that we have in the cement, the cements can be classified as low alkali cements or otherwise. A specification can always say that if the Na 2 O equivalent of a cement is more than 1 percent, the cement will be classified as high alkali cement. If it is less than 0.3 percent, it will be low alkali cement. These numbers are arbitrary and professionally decided by engineers and the bodies which are responsible for writing the codes and specifications for cement, concrete and construction. Now, what is the importance of the alkali content? The property is especially important when we are trying to study the problem of alkali aggregate reaction. Though usually the aggregates in concrete are inert and do not react chemically with the pore solution there are some exceptions and the presence of certain minerals in the aggregates renders them reactive. That is they react 
with the pore solution which may have sodium and potassium ions and of course hydroxyl ions and this reaction leads to premature deterioration of the concrete and that is something which we will study later when we talk of alkali aggregate reactions. And in these cases when the aggregate that we use is reactive then the use of low alkali cements is one of the remedies that can be considered when the use of such aggregates cannot be avoided. Please remember that in concrete construction or civil engineering construction in general we are often forced to use locally available material. If we are constructing a dam or a bridge at a particular location it becomes economically unviable that material such as aggregate which is required in the quantities which are several hundreds of tons to be transported from a very far away place. So, we have to make do with using the aggregate which is locally available may be available within 50 kilometers may be 70 kilometers or 80 kilometers and so on, but it will be very difficult, but it is an engineering decision which is often not taken to reject all the aggregate which is locally available unless the situation is so bad that it cannot be really avoided. Under these conditions when we have to use the aggregate which is locally available which has been classified as potentially reactive then we have no other choice, but to resort to means such as the use of low alkali cement and so on to make sure that even though alkali aggregate reaction may occur the extent of the reaction or the extent of deterioration is still under control. So, it is a largely engineering decision when we do these kind of things. Now, going back to this chart if we look at the other part that is the oxide composition which is given other than the alkali metals, then we should remember that these oxides do not occur as oxides in the clinker. They occur as these four complexes and we have seen how these complexes or the amounts of these complexes are determined using the Bogues equations which are empirical equations and help us estimate the quantities of C 3 A C 2 S C 3 S and C 4 A F on the basis of the oxide composition of the cement. We also know that during the fusion process the oxides get organized differently and the cement can be viewed as a solid solution made up of these complexes and this here gives us the rough breakup of the chemical constitution of cement in terms of the four principal complexes that we have. It is not easily possible to determine the exact percentage of C 3 A and so on, because the moment we try to do any chemical analysis these complexes disintegrate or break up and what we can only determine is the oxide composition and therefore, use of Bose equations etcetera helps us only gives an estimate of the actual amount of C 3 A and other complexes which are present in the cement and as far as most civil engineering applications are concerned that is quite sufficient. Now, continuing our discussion with the properties, these are some of the properties that we can attribute we need to study as far as physical properties which is specific gravity and fineness, consistency, setting time initial and final, strength development, early strength, 28 day strength and ultimate strength, soundness, ignition loss and alkali content. So, these are some of the properties that are important. What we must remember is that these properties are often interrelated the fineness of cement is related to the consistency, the fineness of cement is also related to strength development and so on. So, when we are looking at the properties of cement then we should remember to also look at a comprehensive picture, where we try to relate one property versus the other and be careful as to what our specifications are, what are the kind of 
properties that we really require in a particular case. As I said just now, there is a clear link between the processes of hydration, heat liberation and strength development. For example, C 3 A tricalcium aluminate hydrates most rapidly and liberates the maximum amount of heat and it contributes to the early stiffening of the cement. Similarly, C 2 S the hydration is the slowest and produces least heat and contributes to the ultimate strength of cement. In principle what really happens is the following, when water is added to cement hydration starts immediately and there are different words that we associate with this process setting, stiffening, strength development and so on. These basically refer to the different amounts of workability that the cement paste still has because at the end of it after the water has been added and the reaction starts the hydration starts gradually the cement paste becomes stiffer and it is a matter of time when the stiffness translates into strength development. So, it is really that kind of test that we use to determine or estimate the extent of this hydration reaction that helps us figure out the setting time, the stiffening time or the initial and the final setting time and what is the strength development and all that. Depending on a particular application, we try to have a cement which has a certain characteristic. So, this is something which we must keep at the back of our mind. A cement that is stiffening very rapidly will also have early strength development and in order that the cement stiffen very rapidly, the chemical composition should be such that hydration products are formed early and then we must try to see that those complexes which react faster than the others, they are present in the right amount as far as the cement is concerned. Similarly, if we want the cement to not set very early, for example, there is a long lead time, we do not want to have a construction joint and all that, then we must try to control those complexes which hydrate very early, which give us early stiffening. So, if we control those complexes, we will have a cement which is having a longer initial setting time. So, with this background let us continue with our discussion and we will try to study the prop and we will try to study the relationship between hydration, liberation of heat and development of strength and we in fact use these relationships in developing special cements or different cements. Low heat of hydration cements will have a lower C 3 A content, rapid hardening cements may have a higher C 3 A content that is how we kind of classify cements and we need to have different specifications on the chemical composition of these cements. And the, as far as the factors affecting the OPC properties is concerned, the cement can be characterized in terms of standard consistency, initial and final setting time, strength development, heat liberation, soundness and ignition loss. Some of these things we will talk about today in greater detail and these properties are all determined to some extent by the fineness which is the extent to which the cement has been ground and the chemical composition which is the relative amounts of the four solid complexes. I must reiterate here that the chemical composition of the clinker and the chemical composition of the cement is basically the same. There is no change in the chemical composition during the grinding process except for the addition of gypsum which is a physical process and it comes into play only as far as hydration is concerned or regulating the hydration process is concerned. As far as the cement is concerned chemically the clinker and the cement is more or less the same and that is why we have making a statement here that the chemical properties of cement in terms of chemical composition of these compounds and the fineness which is an independent ingredient, which is an independent property, they really determine the properties of the cement.
for, th for the same clinker it can be ground to different levels of fineness and it will have different properties, but that is because it has different fineness for the same fineness of course you can have different clinkers and they will have different chemical compositions and therefore the properties of the cement can be different. So, we must remember that the properties of cement in terms of standard consistency initial final setting time and so on they are all determined by two basic parameters one is the fineness and the second is the chemical composition. Now, let us try to look at the process of hydration of cement a little more closely the process of reaction of water with the different constituent complexes of cement is what is called hydration. The process is exothermic in nature and involves evolution and liberation of heat. The process starts as soon as water comes in contact with the cement and that is in the mixer itself and continues for several weeks. This is the basis of all our understanding and the discussion that we will have as far as the properties of cement and to that extent even the concrete as we will see later on in this series of lectures. Cement comprises of the different complexes and once water is added to the cement all these complexes more or less simultaneously start the reaction process depending on how fast or how slow the reaction of individual complexes is the cement per se has different rates of reaction. The cement chemists who work with the different solid complexes they artificially manufacture the different complexes and study their hydration characteristics in terms of the rate of hydration, the amount of heat liberated and the kind of hydration products that are formed and so on. And the performance or the reaction of a cement is essentially the sum total of the reactions of all these complexes. So, this picture we must keep at the back of our mind when we study the hydration of a cement and the effect of that hydration on the properties or the changing properties of the cement paste or concrete on account of that hydration process. Now, as far as hydration of the Portland cement is concerned this is a simplified view of the actual reactions which are taking place. C 2 S and C 3 S they react with water to form C S H which is calcium silicate hydrate gel and a lot of calcium hydroxide. So, these are basically the hydration products formed on account of the hydration of tricalcium and dicalcium silicates. As far as C 3 A and C 4 F are concerned they react with the water and the gypsum regulates that reaction and again we get ettringite monosulfates and so on which again become a feeder here the calcium the tricalcium eliminate reacts with the ettringite to give us hydration products. Now, once we understand these reactions we know that as far as the hydration process is concerned C 3 S C 2 S C 3 A and C 4 A F they all react with water to give lots of hydration products and chemists have studied this process in a lot more detail than civil engineers need to really know about to give us ettringite, monosulfate, lot of calcium silicate hydrate gel and calcium hydroxide. As far as civil engineers are concerned most of the time at least as far as the discussion in this set of this lectures is concerned we are concerned only with the formation of calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide in large amounts. We should remember that the C 2 S and C 3 S actually constitute the bulk of the cement as far as the chemical constitution is concerned and therefore, C S H and C H K 
calcium hydroxide in cement chemistry is also called CH because C is the calcium oxide and H is H2O and that is water. So, calcium hydroxide is often called CH when we are trying to write reactions in the language that cement chemists use. So, we are really interested or we are concerned about the formation of CSH and calcium hydroxide in the hydration process. The formations of ettringite, monosulphate and so on, these are intermediate products which also are formed, but to a lesser extent even though their importance cannot be minimized or cannot be undermined simply because the volumes of these products is very small. This is a microscopic model of the hydration of cement. If we look at cement particles here, which is before the hydration, we can assume that the cement particles are spherical and are having different particle sizes. We should remember that the cement particles are actually not spherical at all, they are actually highly angular, but from the point of view of analysis, simulation or modeling, there is no harm in assuming that cement is made up of spherical particles of different sizes. Now, once these cement particles are coming in contact with what is, they come in contact with water, what we have is hydration process starting. Now, one way of looking at this hydration process is the formation of these hydrates here around all the cement particles and the hydration products are getting intertwined between different particles of cement. And there is a lot of unhydrated cement which is still waiting to be hydrated as more and more hydration takes place. And this is precisely why cement hydration takes a long time, because only over a period of time does water which is sitting here and the cement which is sitting here, they gradually interact, react and more and more of these hydration products are formed and the unhydrated part of the cement shrinks giving more and more hydration products. And this process once we understand, we have a perfect understanding or a good enough understanding to go forward and study more about the properties of the cement paste and concrete and how it changes as more and more hydration takes place. In this picture, we, have, we are talking of hydration of the cement or the cement particle. We must keep at the back of our mind that each of these cement particles actually consists of different complexes C 2 S, C 3 S, C 4 A F and so on. And once this cement particles comes in contact with the water, each of these phases they start their own reactions. And when we are talking of the unhydrated cement particle, that means that part of C 3 S is unhydrated, part of C 2 S is unhydrated, part of C 3 A is unhydrated and so on. The extent of the availability of these unhydrated solid complexes depends on how these individual solid complexes react, what is their individual rates of reaction as far as water is concerned. We must also keep at the back of our mind that as more and more hydration takes place, the water molecules have to go through this hydration products to reach the unhydrated layer of cement. Sooner or later therefore, we may have a situation that the hydration actually stops. Now, what are the conditions under which the hydration actually stops? There are three conditions. One is that all the water that we have around the cement is exhausted, whether or not there is unhydrated cement, there is exhaustion of water, the water is finished. The second situation arises when all the cement has been hydrated, that is there is no unhydrated cement even if there is some water around, there is no unhydrated cement and therefore, hydration has stopped. There is a third situation 
where the products of hydration which have been formed and deposited around the cement particles, they become so dense that they do not allow the passage of water from the outside to reach the core cement which is unhydrated. If we look at this original cement particle with water sitting outside and after a certain degree of hydration, this is the unhydrated cement core. If the density and the amount of these hydration products becomes such that water molecules find it impossible to penetrate these hydration products and reach the surface here, then the hydration essentially stops. Even though unhydrated cement is available, water is available, but no further hydration can take place simply because the hydration products become a barrier to the movement of water through the hydration products and they are prevented from reaching the cement surface. This here is a simplified model for hydration of cement for those of you who are more mathematically inclined. If there is a liquid outside and a solid and that is what is the cement water interface looking like. If this x was very small and that indeed is very small, we can assume that the liquid is actually diffusing into the solid and we can assume in that case that the reaction rate is proportional to the concentration gradient of the liquid and therefore, inversely proportional to the thickness of this layer through which the liquid has to diffuse. And if we are able to write this equation, which is the rate of change of this layer, the d x upon d t being equal to k times c upon x, if we solve this, we get an equation something which is very simple, which is something like this. Now, if we are able to do some more mathematics of that, then we will get these kind of reactions, where we can from which we can study the rate of reaction that is the rate at which the spherical particle is dissolving under the process of hydration. It starts with an initial radius of r and then as time goes on more and more of this x is formed and the r actually reduces. So, this is something which we can do if we are doing a mathematical analysis or a simulation or modeling of the hydration process. These again are reactions which we have already studied. So, we will skip that except that I should just point out the extents of C S H and C H which are formed in all these reactions. There are other hydration products like those which are formed when calcium eliminates the tricalcium aluminate and the tetracalcium albinoferrides when they react they give these tricalcium aluminate hyd hydration products. And now we will take a closer look at the hydration of each of these constituent minerals. As we said, cement comprises of these four principal solid complexes and now we will take a closer look at the hydration of each of these solids. As far as C3A is concerned, we should remember that it constitutes about 10 percent of cement. It is the phase that reacts the fastest and is responsible for the initial setting of cement. Gypsum is added in fact to the cement to essentially control this reaction and the heat evolution involved as far as C3A hydration is concerned is to the extent of about 13 and 50 joules per gram. And this is how tricalcium aluminates they react that is after the time from mixing, what is the degree of hydration, how it moves. This is something which you see here which is water, gypsum, calcium hydroxides which are formed, the calcium hydroxide and gypsum which is formed and what is written here at the bottom. If you read it carefully, it says that the hydration of the tricalcium eliminates is very rapid and it becomes hard quickly and becomes impossible to cast and that is what we need to control if we want to take the concrete some distance which may take some time. And the case of calcium hydroxide, which is the hydration products from C3S and C2S, which are also reacting at the same time, 
the reaction of C 3 A becomes slower. So, we are actually talking of a situation where the hydration of C 3 A is tempered by the presence of gypsum which throws in a lot of sulphates into the solution. Coming to C 4 A F that also constitutes about 10 percent of the cement depending upon the quantity of iron in the clay as an impurity. It is responsible for the grey colour of cement. The presence of gypsum also affects the hydration of this phase and this contributes little to the long term strength and sets slowly liberating about 420 joules per gram. And this is the picture here which is the hydration of C 3 A and C 4 A F together and the hydration of C 3 A is controlled by the formation of ettringite and that is again promoted after about a day of hydration. The hydration of C 4 A F is essentially a relatively slow reaction. As far as the hydration of C 2 S is concerned it is an important thing that we must understand because it constitutes about 15 to 35 percent of the cement. It hydrates slowly and is responsible for the ultimate strength in cement. The hydration of C 2 S liberates only about 260 joules per gram of heat. C 2 S we must remember contributes to the ultimate strength of the cement. And this is the hydration of C 3 S and C 2 S together and the ratio of these C 2 S and C 3 S that can be varied depending on our manufacturing process, the kind of raw materials that we use. The hydration of C 3 S in fact is promoted by the coexistence of C 2 S and the reaction of C 2 S is promoted by C 3 S in the early stages and is delayed by C 3 S in the long term. So, it is a very complex process and civil engineers are increasingly being called upon to understand the hydration process as we try to engineer the cements. We try to develop new cements where we want ultimate strengths which may be not necessarily achieved at 28 days. That is something which we will discuss in some other lecture when we are probably talking of high strength concrete and so on. A lot of civil engineering structures are not subjected to high levels of load in the initial stages maybe in the first six months maybe one year. And therefore, the quality control as far as these structures is concerned can easily be done at a 91 day strength or a six month strength. For that we need to have our cements that continue to hydrate much longer than the normal cements where the hydration could be mostly over within let us say about two months or three months. Of course, what also it goes with it is that the final acceptance of such concretes is delayed to the extent of six months or maybe three months and that is a risk that professionals need to take when we are talking of special concretes, special cements and so on. So, now as far as the reaction of A light is concerned we are talking of C 3 S it is exactly the same model that we talked about earlier where we are taking A light to be a spherical particle unhydrated C 3 S and that is reacting initially through the formation of hydration products and water and A light gives us hydrate A which gives us the second reaction which is C S H and calcium hydroxide the reaction C is the final stage reaction where C 3 S also at the end of it gives us C S H and calcium hydroxide. And although Portland cement is composed of many mineral compounds this model assumes that the Portland cement is comprising only of C 3 S. Those are simplifications which we make when we carry out simulations and model studies where instead of saying that the same cement particle has different extents or is made up of different amounts of C 2 S C 3 S and so on. We can make an assumption and say that well cement comprises of different particles made up of C 3 S C 2 S and so on and each of them starts to hydrate or react with water once they come in contact with water. So, this is what we have in the final stage where we have some C S H outside here and some C H S somewhere here and there is the unhydrated C 3 S sitting here in the inside. 
and depending upon the age at which we are looking at this picture, the type of CSH or the density of the CSH in this layer and this layer is different and that is what is making it impossible for the water present here to go and attack the surface of the cement particle which will give us full further hydration. If we try to find out the reaction thickness of A light which is in terms of log of millimeters that is how it is plotted that is how it goes there is an there are experiments which support this simulation process and it should can be applied only but we should remember that this model can be applied only to the hydration of A light and not really to that of Portland cement. Now, coming to CSA gel which is the most important hydration product as we talked about earlier in the discussion today. The calcium silicate hydrate gel which is referred to loosely as the CSH gel because its stoichiometry varies depending on the amounts of calcium oxide and silicon oxide in the cement. And this important gel is the most important hydration product from cement from the point of view of strength development. So, the denser and the better quality CSH gel that we get the better is the strength as far as cement is concerned. Now, let us take a closer look once again at the heat of hydration. When Portland cement is mixed with water heat is liberated and this is what is called the heat of hydration and the result of which is the result of the exothermic chemical reaction between cement and water. The heat generated by the cement's hydration raises the temperature of concrete. We will continue this line of discussion when we are talking of mass concrete. Today we are trying to understand that yes when cement hydrates it reacts with water a lot of heat is liberated and this heat liberated raises the temperature of the concrete. We need to take this heat away from the concrete somehow and dissipate it in the atmosphere that is something which the dissipation part is something which we will talk about when we talk of mass concrete. This slide here taken from the text concrete microstructure properties and materials gives us the 3 day, 90 day and the 13 year heats of hydration in terms of calories per gram for the 4 principal components. And we can see that depending on the compound the amount of heat that is liberated early is different and not only these numbers are different, but also the percentage of this particular number with respect to the ultimate heat of hydration that is quite different. For example, if we are looking at C3S we are looking at 58 calories per gram liberated in 3 days as against 122 which may be taken as the ultimate heat of hydration of C3S compared to that we have 69 in case of C 4 A F as against 102, 212 against 324 and so on. So, there are different ways of looking at the data here and I will leave it as a assignment or a thought for you that please look at this data and understand the properties of the cement in light of the rates of heat liberated from the different compounds. Now, if you look at the summary of the properties of cement and the hydration process, cement clinker contains 4 major compounds C3S, C2S, C3A and C4AF. The reaction rates of C3S and C3A are the fastest, the reaction rates of C2S and C4AF are slow, the reactions of C3A and water is very early, it becomes hard quickly and it is impossible to cast the concrete after that process has started or has been initiated. The reaction of tricalcium aluminate and water is very quick and leads to hardening of the paste rendering the concrete difficult to cast and on the other hand in the presence of gypsum the rate of reaction of C 3 A is controlled it becomes slow. The reaction rate of each of the mineral components of cement increases with the increase in temperature. This picture here shows the typical reaction curve of Portland cement 
in terms of the rate of heat liberated. Initially we have a lot of heat liberated which goes down and there is a stable period here and again we have a peak where a lot of heat is liberated and we have the gradual dying out of the hydration reactions. This process here is a matter of minutes, this process here is a matter of hours and this continues over several days and that is something which we must keep at the back of our mind when we study the properties of cement hydration that the hydration reaction continues over a very long period of time and at different points in time different products are formed as we can see here. And these products they have different roles to play as far as the properties such as setting, stiffening and strength development of concrete is concerned. Now as far as the interaction between the sulphates and solution which is coming from gypsum. and the reactivity of the tricalcium aluminate in the clinker is concerned. If we have both as low what, what we get is normal setting, if they are both very high we get rapid setting, if there is a high low and a low high combination we get quick setting and false setting and if this is completely absent we get a flash set where the cement is rendered hard very quickly and is impossible to cast. So this is something which is a summary of how the reaction of cement takes place in the presence of the gypsum. And this here is a summary of the hydration or the degree of hydration versus time for the different phases of the cement that is C2S, C3S, C4AF and C3A. Now before we close the discussion we should spend some time and try to understand the pore structure of the hardened cement composites. These are the chemical reactions of C3S and C2S and their reactions with water. There is a mass involved and there is a volume involved. So the, there is a mass of C3S or C2S and so on which is reacting with the water and like all chemical reactions there is a very definite stoichiometry of these chemical reactions. A certain amount of C3A requires a certain amount of water for complete reaction and if we extend that principle we will have a statement which to the effect that in order that a cement completely hydrate a certain amount of water is chemically required whether or not from engineering considerations the hydration proceeds to a logical conclusion is a different story. It does not stop us from saying that from a chemical point of view cement requires a certain amount of water to hydrate completely. Hydration process which involves the formation of hydration products and consumption of water can also lead to changes in volume and that is what is shown here. The volume after a reaction is slightly smaller than the volume before the reaction. That is the volume of the reaction products, the hydration products is slightly smaller. What effectively it means is that there is the tendency for the concrete to shrink. Please remember that cement and water are only a very small constituent or contribute only a certain extent of the total volume of concrete and therefore the shrinkages which we see here do not reflect or do not appear in the same magnitudes when we are talking of concrete because the relative volume of cement paste is quite small in the concrete mix. Now having said that let us take a look at what is happening in a schematic and a qualitative sense. Initially we have cement and water which is present. In the intermediate phase what has happened is that the cement has become lesser, some amount of hydration products have been formed and some amount of water has been consumed. So only this amount of water is now left and this is the amount of 
pore space which has been generated on account of shrinkage. Continuing from here when we come to the final stage we have the cement is completely consumed and therefore, we do not have any cement left. All the cement has been converted into hydration products here. Some amount of water is left because the amount of water which is added to the cement paste in general is usually higher than the amount of water required from the chemical point of view for ensuring complete hydration of cement. And this water remains as water within the hydration products and this is the pore space on account of shrinkage. We should now try to see what happens to this water at the end of the day. This water actually escapes in the atmosphere and therefore, what we have is the total pore space available after this amount of water and cement have reacted is this. Because this water once it leaves the hydration products that also leaves behind void spaces. So, this void here and this amount of shrinkage here is in a manner of speaking the total change in the volume or the total change in the solids and liquids which are there in the system. So, let us look at the small example a numerical example which says that let us consider a paste of water cement ratio of 40 percent. Now, if we have 314 grams of cement we will have 125.6 grams of water assuming that the specific gravity of cement is 3.14 the volumetric composition of the paste is 100 cc of cement because 100 cc into 3.14 is 314 and 125.6 cc of water density of water being 1 and therefore, we have the total paste volume of 225.6 which is 100 plus 125.6 and the total mass of the paste is 439.6 which is coming from 314 grams of cement and 125.6 grams of water. Now, if we assume that complete hydration of the cement needs 25 percent of water by weight of the cement and we assume for the time being that there is no change in the volume of the cement paste during hydration. So, we are basically saying that we are ignoring any shrinkage that occurs. Then what we are having is a situation something like this 78.5 grams of the 125.6 grams of water will be consumed in the hydration. The 78.5 is nothing but 314 grams of cement multiplied by 0.25 because that is what we have assumed is the amount of water which is required for ensuring complete hydration. Now, if this 78.5 grams of water is consumed then 47.1 grams of water will be left behind which is unreacted and will eventually escape leaving behind void spaces. Now, given that the initial volume of the cement paste was 225.6 as we saw in the last slide and the assumption that we have made that there is no shrinkage and so on and the arithmetic that we do here the hydration products will weigh 392.5 grams which is the sum of 78.5 grams of water and 314 grams of cement and they will occupy 178.5 cc of space. Now, diagrammatically speaking this is the cement that we had this is the water that we had, these are the hydration products that are formed and this is the unreacted water that we are left with at the end of the whole reaction process. Now, please remember that this water does not separate and just appear at the top of the hydration products. This water is actually distributed throughout the hydration product as is shown here. There can be large channels having a larger diameter, a smaller channels like this, they can be connected, they may not be connected and so on and so forth. These channels of water here are finally, the pores which will be left behind when this water finds its way out into the atmosphere. 
Now, if you look at an intermediate situation, we can have cement, water, unhydrated cement in the intermediate stage, unreacted water and whatever hydration products are formed. And these hydration products themselves also have a certain amount of water which is trapped within, which at the end of it will escape. And depending on whether or not the final product or the final reaction reaches this state, where there is no unhydrated cement, we can have a situation that there will be some unhydrated cement also sitting in the final system of concrete. Now, once we have this understanding that yes, water is present in the hydration products and it will eventually escape. This picture here shows us the different kinds of pores that are found or that have been identified as far as the understanding of cement hydration products and concrete engineering is concerned. There is entrapped air, there is entrained air, there is capillary pores, gel pores and intercrystallite pores. They have different size ranges. For example, entrapped air is the largest, it is there in the millimeter order. Entrained air is slightly smaller and then we have a large range here of capillary pores, a very small range here for gel pores and then there are some other pores, the intercrystallite pores which is there within the different CSH layers and so on. So, this picture here gives us an idea that concrete or cement hydration products, they have different pores, the genesis of those pores comes from largely the unhydrated water that is left behind and which finally escapes. So, once we understand this part, we can talk in terms of a pore size distribution. The gel pores, the capillary pores, that is entrained air and entrapped air and we can talk in terms of what is the percentage contribution of each of these pores of different sizes to the total porosity. And that is something which we will try to talk about at some other point in time. Remember that this porosity leads to the permeability of the concrete, making the concrete susceptible to attack from deleterious material from the atmosphere, from the saline water or whatever depending on the environment to which the concrete structure is exposed. Now, before we conclude our discussion for today, let us try to go back and see what we need to do further. Study the classification of cement in light of cement composition, the high early strength cement, high the low heat of hydration cements, low alkali cements and so on and so forth. Learn more about the chemistry and kinetics of hydration reactions, today we did not talk about them much. You study the effect of addition of mineral and chemical admixtures on the hydration process. Learn more about the models of hydration of cement, there are models like the NIST model or the Goto model, literature is available about that, which explains how cement hydrates, what are the different uh, properties which are studied in the hydration process and how they affect the properties of the concrete. And I would like you to create images in your mind to model the process of hydration divided into setting, stiffening and strength development. Because once you have that in the mind very clearly, it facilitates understanding of other processes and the concrete engineering in general. I would like to acknowledge the help from the JSCE, the Tokyo and the Kajima Corporation in Japan the friends and colleagues at IIT Kanpur, Tokyo University and the construction industry in India and Japan and Professor Womoto in the Public Works Research Institute Sukuba and formerly professor of the University of Tokyo who helped tremendously to improve or to develop my own understanding of cement hydration. Thank you. <laughs>